Welcome to Common Sense Institute's Common Sense Digest podcast. My name is Megan Garn, and I'm the Director of Operations with Common Sense Institute. If you've been enjoying this content, I encourage you to subscribe to our e-newsletter, the Common Sense Digest, so you can stay up to date with important news and policy happenings. We feature our research, upcoming events, job openings, and more. You can subscribe at www.commonsenseinstitute.co.org. And now, here's your host, Earl Wright. Welcome to Common Sense Digest Podcast. My name is Earl Wright, and I'm chairman of the board of Common Sense Institute. Thank you for joining us today. With the 2022 legislative session ending and the passage of one of the most debated issues, House Bill 22-1326, Fentanyl Accountability and Prevention, we thought it would be worth exploring what impacts the legislation may have to inf- this legislation may have to fentanyl possession and distribution. With over 800 fentanyl-related deaths occurring in our state in 2021, it is evident that Colorado has a fentanyl crisis. Joining this conversation today, and a report co-authors of the CSI Criminal Justice Fellows, Mitch Morrissey and George Brockler. Mitch Morrissey served as the elected district attorney for the second judicial district covering Denver, Colorado from 2005 to 2017. Prior to 2005, Mitch was trial lawyer in the Denver District Attorney's Office. Mitch is internationally recognized for his expertise in DNA technology and applying that technology to solve crimes. Welcome, Mitch, and thank you for all you do. Thank you, Earl. Glad to be here today. George Brockler served as the elected district attorney for the 18th Judicial District, Colorado's most populous district, which includes Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Lincoln Counties. From 2013 to 2021, as a state prosecutor, he handled the felony cases from the Columbine High School mass shooting case, the Aurora Theater mass shooting case, and more recently, the STEM Academy School mass shooting case. Welcome, George. It's good to have you today. Sir, thanks for having me back. I wish it was to talk about the Broncos or the Avalanche or something like that, but this is a pretty pressing problem. Before we begin, if you'd like more background on the discussion today, listeners can find CSI's latest report regarding this subject titled Fentanyl's Increasing Toll on the Colorado Economy on CSI's website at www.commonsenseinstituteco.org. Let's get started. Mitch, uh, we've got an increasing issue of fentanyl in the state of Colorado. I mentioned some uh, numbers recently with regards to the increase. In a report you found, there were 540 fentanyl-related deaths in 2019, but fast forward to 2021, and that number is 800 deaths, a 260% increase. Can you give us some insight as to why you think the number of fentanyl-related deaths has increased so significantly? What's going on? Well, the legislature made a change uh, about possession of certain narcotics, almost all narcotics, from heroin to fentanyl, cocaine, all of those things. And they basically changed it to the point where if you had a gram to four grams, it was a misdemeanor offense. And they did that in 2019. Then we just started to see this dramatic increase in the people that were overdosing and dying from fentanyl. And fentanyl is used to cut sometimes cocaine and other narcotics and a lot of times there's people just flat out addicted to fentanyl and when you decriminalize the amounts that we're talking about these are user amounts but you know four grams of fentanyl is enough to kill 2,000 people it is a deadly deadly substance the fact that it's a narcotic just adds to it because people are consuming it. But if you come in contact with very small amounts of fentanyl, there's a likelihood that it will kill you. And I believe that since the legislature said, well, fentanyl possession is no big deal, we got a flood of fentanyl into our state. People that deal these narcotics pay attention to the law. They pay attention to how much they can carry and not commit a felony. And so those are the kinds of things that are going on. But fentanyl is just an extremely dangerous, dangerous thing. George, uh, would you like to add anything? Yeah, I agree with Mitch. Um, I'm going to use the words that 
Governor Polis used, and that is it is like anthrax, and it should be treated like a deadly poison. We did not get here overnight. Uh, this has been a long process, and it, not just on the drug front, but we have seen the Colorado legislature over a period of sessions now continue to decrease accountability for criminal conduct in almost every arena. We've gotten to the point now where we view any type of incarceration as somehow inhumane and ineffective. And so what that's done for drug users and drug addicts is we continue to recycle them through a booking process and sending them right back out out into the streets where they got the drugs that got them in trouble with the law, but they have absolutely zero incentive. There's no carrot and there's no stick to participating in any sort of drug treatment. And so what we end up doing is we end up noxaloning these people repeatedly, hoping against hope that they'll, they'll come to their senses and try to get off the drugs, but they don't. And so we have this increased number of deaths. We're at a point now, Earl, where it's, I think, about three people a day are dying from this fentanyl overdose. And, you know, we had a governor who in January demanded the legislature do something about it. And it took them four months to come up with this bill that we're going to talk about. And you can do the math. That's hundreds of Coloradans dead while the legislature tried to figure out how to fix this issue. I don't think they did it. I'm confused, guys. We had legislation that was passed that, in effect, has contributed to this increase in deaths. Did I hear you correctly? I believe that it has because I believe just the mass number of her- of, of fentanyl that has come into our state is due in large part to this change in 2019. I think that it, Earl, people don't do certain things that are felonies because they know they are felonies. And when you say, okay, it's legal or it's only a misdemeanor, then they're willing to give it a shot. And you know, this is a highly addictive drug. I'm not saying that people weren't addicted to it before 2019, but when you decriminalize it to a level of a misdemeanor, then people are more inclined to try it. They're more inclined to use it. They're more inclined to possess it. And that leads to death. I mean, there's just no kidding about it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fentanyl addicts that are out there that haven't died yet. But the overdoses that we're seeing throughout the state from this deadly substance um, has just gone way up since they made it a misdemeanor to have this amount. And remember, four grams would kill 2,000 people. So one gram, if you do the math, we're talking about 500 people. And I guess the state of Colorado with this new bill was willing to make that compromise and uh, you know, I think 500 people is unacceptable as well. Okay, but but deal with my relatively simple you know, misunderstanding. It seems to me there's users and there's dealers. The legislation that was passed, you're suggesting that the dealers were somehow protected by the legislation that was passed, but the legislators, if I've read things correctly, were trying to protect the users with the legislation and not necessarily trying to protect the dealers? Or am I missing something here? Well, if you're in possession of four grams of fentanyl, you are a dealer. And they completely ignored that. You don't need four grams of fentanyl in order to get high, to use fentanyl. There's no reason to be in Union Station the train station in Denver with four grams of fentanyl unless you're dealing four grams of fentanyl. There's really no reason to be there using fentanyl at all, but it's one of the major places where fentanyl is used in the city of Denver. But even having one gram of it implies that you are sharing it or dealing it and also potentially using it. So the legislature just tried to fit You know, it's a one-size-fit-all with all substances back in 2019, and this substance is different. This amount of cocaine may kill you, probably not kill you. This amount of heroin may kill you, may not kill you. You're not going to use four grams of heroin in one use anyway, but a very, very small amount of fentanyl could kill you. If you have it in your home and your child comes in contact with them, and we have the cases now in Colorado where now young toddlers have come across it and it's killed them. 
in very, very small amounts, much less than one gram. So the idea that somebody has four grams of it and they're just a user is just, I think, a ridiculous um, way to think about this. <clears throat> We're going to get to the new legislation that's being passed in a second, but let's look at the uh, the cost of uh, the fentanyl-related deaths. Uh, George, uh, the report indicates an estimated cost of fentanyl-related deaths in the last five years in Colorado, and it said in 2021 the deaths cost us $11.1 billion. And in the report, that's practically a nine- to ten-fold increase over the last five years. What in the world is going on that uh, – is it just the number of deaths? And how are the costs calculated? Uh, but I think we'd all be interested in knowing that. It is the number of deaths that has caused the dramatic increase in the cost to the state. But it's not just calculated as a cost, for instance, uh, to treat the person or to bury them. It's not that kind of cost as much as it is also – the loss and productivity potential that that person would have had over the course of their lifetime. When you take a father, a, a son, a mother, a daughter who have a lifetime of potential earnings contributions either to their family or to the community, those things get taken into account when that life is snuffed out. More often than not, when they're much earlier, it's not 70 and 80 year olds aren't overdosing on fentanyl. It is a younger crowd that has far more earning potential down the road. And this cost is only going to increase as the numbers continue to increase. I would expect unabated, and I'm going to cut to the chase here, this law that was passed, in my opinion, will have no positive impact on what we're seeing on the streets right now. My expectation is we will continue to see at least this level of overdose deaths most likely an increase in that number of overdose deaths over the next year, two years, as we come back to revisit this. So that cost is just going to be amplified that much more. It'll be many more billions. That's tragic. Mitch, do you have any comments? I agree with George. I think that, you know, we're going to talk about this this bill that got passed and signed into law just the other day. And I, I think that the, the idea of going after people that are dealing fentanyl that, that is right, and that's what they should do. But we're really where they missed the boat was understanding that this is a deadly substance. And I, I know George could come up and give you a list of things that are just, because they are so deadly, they are a felony. And fentanyl should be in that list. No one would argue that having dynamite should be a felony. Nobody would argue with you that having a sawed-off shotgun, which is a felony because it's so dangerous, a machine gun, the same kind of thing. We have a whole list of things that just flat-out kill people. That's what they're for, and that's what fentanyl is. So the idea of making possession of any amount of fentanyl, anything less than a felony, I think, Colorado is misguided in what they are doing around this deadly substance. You were both making a, an absolute case that as far as fentanyl is concerned, it just – any amount of it, it has to be off the streets. Any amount of it has to have litigation against – or legislation against it. Do I hear you correctly? Now, that's my position. I took the position when we did the study, before we did the study – you know, and, and I think that what is going on is people are saying, well, you know, we have people that are addicted to this. We need to deal with treatment. We need to do – they only are in possession. We need to treat them differently. And, you know, we, for years, the whole time I was a prosecutor, we dealt with these different narcotics as felonies and dealt with treat the treatment side of those with drug courts and those kinds of things. So to say that we can't do that – and make this deadly substance a felony, the fact that people actually ingest it voluntarily, uh, we can deal with that. And we've always dealt with that in this state. Uh, why you make it a misdemeanor, I have some ideas why they made it a misdemeanor, but I think they've made a deadly mistake in doing that. I'm going to pretend that I'm playing DA and attorney for a second, which is dangerous, okay? Fun. So I'm sitting here listening to what you're saying, and and Mitch and George, I don't understand why legislation couldn't say that uh, any amount of, sorry, fentanyl is a uh, felony, but if you have one ounce or less and you go into treatment, that you could, in essence, after you go through treatment and the results of that treatment, it could be, then your, your, your record could be 
it's behind and it could be a misdemeanor or something yeah. like that. Or, or am I just, hey, I'm just no. a simple country boy here trying to look up the issue. You are a simple country boy who has described the universe that existed before the legislature came in and broke the law. We had uh, gotten together, prosecutors too, and all the other stakeholders years ago, and changed Colorado's drug laws so that a user, an addict, would come in on a felony charge, which is a tremendous incentive to want to participate. In the drug courts that Mitch's office did so well, our office created the same thing. In the diversion programs, it was a great incentive to do that. But at the end of the day, even if you ended up being convicted, if you completed all of the treatment, all of the sentencing requirements the judge put upon you, that felony would, in the term of art they use, is wobble. It would wobble back to a misdemeanor. And so you wouldn't be a convicted felon. And that's exactly what you're describing. That's the way the world was before the legislature came in and said, we can't even suffer the potential risk that someone might be convicted of a felony. And it is premised on this false narrative, this idea that if you allow people who are uh, possessing these low amounts of drugs to be charged with a felony, it's only going to result in tons of felony convictions and mass incarceration of addicts. And, you know, Mitch is famous for having said during the 12 years that he was running the Denver DA's office that if you show me a person who is in prison for just simply possessing usable amounts of drugs, I will get them out because it doesn't exist. We haven't done that in decades. We have always been focused on the idea of treating addicts like addicts and trying to get them off the substance. This is a false narrative that has driven the legislature to make these decisions that have broken the law that they failed to fix this session. Earl, we had a situation in our drug court where we had the felony and all of the things that went with that potentially, but the years that it would take someone to get through drug court sometimes, they would relapse, they would disappear on us, we would bring them back and put them back into drug court with the idea of getting them clean and sober. And I would get criticized by people. Why do you do that? Why do you coddle these drug addicts? Well, drug addicts, when they are drug addicts, are criminals, And when you get them clean and sober, they stop committing the other crimes that go along with addiction. So they may be thieves. They may be burglars. They usually will start out victimizing their families first. And if you get them clean and sober, they get out of the system. And so we had it set up in our drug court on a felony charge that if they were successful— They didn't even get a misdemeanor conviction. What George is talking about is the wobbling down to a misdemeanor. That's still on your record as a conviction. We were giving them deferred judgments, and if they completed it, it got dismissed with no conviction whatsoever. Sometimes it would take four or five years for them to process through our drug court and and graduate and then be clean and sober, and many of them stayed clean and sober for years. One of them became our drug court magistrate. He was a heroin addict. He ended up then getting appointed to the bench and now is a Denver District Court judge. He went through our drug court. He got his case dismissed because he was successful. He took to it. He became the best magistrate that we had. Because he knew it, he lived it, he'd been an addicted person. He was going to end his life just be, just at the time he got arrested by the Denver police, and they saved his life. And now he's one of the best judges that sits on the bench in Denver. That's a great story, Mitch. That's great. I, I am astounded by what I'm hearing, and I hope the folks on the podcast uh, uh, think about what you all are saying. And uh, I, I have a hunch they're going to conclude something similar to what I'm about to say. And that is that we have legislation that was started with all the best intents in the world but didn't have substance behind the legislation to support what they were, in essence, saying was a problem. And now they've created a problem. And the resolution to that problem that they created may not be an entire – in fact, it may be half a solution. And, George, you're suggesting it could be contributing to the continuation – of the problem we have today with fentanyl deaths. A hundred percent. I mean, if there's a corollary to spare the rod, spoil the child, it's spare the accountability, kill the addict. 
I mean, you cannot let them go without the incentive to participate in the very successful programs that Mitch's office ran, that we ended up running. Um, You can't just cajole these people into giving up a substance that has defined their waking moments in life. And this fentanyl is the most addictive, most powerful drug we have seen in my career. And I've only been doing this 27 years. And yet we have somehow through this law made it harder to prosecute than any other drug out there. That is crazy. And your point is fentanyl, if it were any amount illegal, that would put them into a system or process that would help solve, help them similar to what you had talked about, Mitch, that you had done previous to the current, well, the previous uh, legislation. Yes. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it's a fair statement. It could help them. We lost people. Yep. Uh, lost people to other narcotics, not fentanyl necessarily, that were in our program, that graduated for our program and relapsed and ended up ODing and dying but you weren't on having, other drugs. You but you weren't having anything like what we're experiencing no. today. Oh, no, nothing like we're happening today. But, you know, the to, to Earl, I, I've got to tell you, I, I I don't necessarily agree with the idea that they they just passed this law without really thinking about it, made a mistake. What I've seen from the legislature since I was the elected district attorney was the idea of getting things to misdemeanors, and the listeners need to understand. Who pays for misdemeanors and who pays for felonies in the state of Colorado? Misdemeanors are paid for by the counties. The sentencing for a misdemeanor is in the county jail. Any treatment that would come with a drug conviction as a misdemeanor would be done by the counties. And the state provides nothing. If it's a felony and they are in the felony system, say on felony probation, like we had hundreds of people thousands of people in our drug court that were under some kind of supervision. Now, they weren't in prison, but they were under probation. That's paid for by the state. And I believe that this legislature, over the course of the last 15 years, has figured out how to save the state money. You don't have to provide any treatment dollars if somebody is committing a misdemeanor and getting convicted of a misdemeanor. That's what I think they're doing here. That's what I think they did in 2019. Shift the cost to the counties and save us the money. I really believe that's what they did. There, there's one other aspect of this, too, and that's insightful, Mitch. Um, the, the difference in procedure between how a misdemeanor and a felony are handled makes a big difference, too, especially when it comes to addicts. When you're talking about trying to do the carrot and the stick thing. Felonies, you get arrested, you go into the system, you may have to post a bond where the judge says, hey, I'll let you out, but you got to promise to do X, Y, and Z, monitored sobriety, all that stuff. With a misdemeanor, outside of domestic violence, it is really an invitation to come to court. You're not spending the night in jail. You're not going to go see a judge. You get scratched a little ticket that's much like a traffic ticket. And then we expect them to go back out into these fentanyl-laden streets, but somehow remember to come to court and then abide by the court's edicts in this case. So it's not just the money saving for the state. It takes away tools from law enforcement. I'd rather stay on this conversation to talk about the legislation, but we have, we have uh, the legislation that's been passed, and I think there are questions that will come out of that. Uh, George, the 2022 legislative session has recently come to a close. Could you summarize the new fentanyl bill? Uh, House Bill 22-1326, and what are the new parameters for fentanyl possession and distribution in Colorado? Well, it does a bunch of different things, or tries to, and one is to try to address that gaping hole of a mistake it created by um, allowing possession of up to 2,000 lethal doses of fentanyl to be considered just a misdemeanor, but it also does provide some money, and when I say some and emphasize that, we do need money put towards rehabilitation. This amount of money is a drop in the bucket compared to what is really needed. To if charge. I read the paper correctly this morning on the fentanyl bill, it's 28.6 or 28.9 million that's going to be made available to the counties in some of the treatment. And if I hear you folks correctly and my numbers correct, I can't even imagine that starts to handle the issue. But. No, it's not enough. And when you're dealing with a 38 point something billion dollar budget, it doesn't adequately represent the risk to the community as well as what we need to do to invest the right monies to fix it. It does um, it purportedly drop down the level for felony charges for possession of fentanyl to one gram. But one of the things that they did, and I'd love to hear Mitch's take on this, 
is they come up with the weirdest sort of, it's not quite an affirmative defense, but it's a way out for people that makes the burden. I'm not even sure who it rests on, Mitch. I'm not sure if it's the prosecution or the defense. I don't know what the instruction given to the jury is. I've never seen anything this convoluted in a law that we've had that makes it largely, I think, ineffective. They've also done a couple weird things with distribution. Wait, I want to follow up on that. As I understand that point, if I am a drug dealer, you know, somehow you have to get me to say that I intended to sell drugs versus just having them, and I just happen to have these on me, and I'm not a drug dealer. In other words, I've got to, in essence, admit to something here as a drug dealer that any well-coached person wouldn't be admitting to. For, for the possession piece, they had, they had originally plugged in something where we would have had to have proven that they knew what they possessed right. with fentanyl, which is a standard that applies to no other drugs. And in short of someone wearing a T-shirt that says, I'm with fentanyl, or admitting to it, there's no way. So they said, we'll fix that. We'll change it. And instead what they've said is, now the jury can be given an instruction that says, if this person reasonably believed or did not know reasonably that they were possessing fentanyl. I don't know what the standard is. Is that something I have to disprove as a prosecutor beyond a reasonable doubt? Is it a presumption they get? Do they have to prove anything? Is it burden shifting? I don't really know. When you get to the distribution piece, two of the things that stuck out in my mind were, one, there is no promise of prison for drug dealers who kill people under two interesting circumstances. One is, if you deal fentanyl and you kill a room full of human beings, but you have less than four grams of it in your pocket at the time, you escape liability from that. You don't have to go to prison. I escape liability is too strong. If you kill a room full of people with fentanyl, an unlimited, a mile-high stadium full of people, but you stick around next to the bodies while the first responders get there, and you cooperate with law enforcement, you are immune from prosecution for that provision of the statute. That is crack smoke crazy. That makes no sense. If the burden is on the defendant to prove anything in a criminal case, the statute is unconstitutional. And that's one of my problems with this bill and the way they changed it and the way that they created this strange situation. And when you're talking to two seasoned prosecutors like us and we can't even tell you who has the burden to prove this, well, the one thing I know is you can't give the defendant a burden to prove anything in a criminal case. You are assumed to be innocent until somebody proves it beyond a reasonable doubt, and you don't have to prove anything ever as a defendant. And if this law is written in a way that they have the burden of proof, the person has a burden of proof, then it's just flat out unconstitutional and a waste of time to even have passed it. And that's my concern with it. I think that uh, George is absolutely right when it comes to this waiting around. But Earl, the reason this was put in there is that fentanyl is used to cut other narcotics. And so you'll have people, we had a whole group, I think it was a whole family of people in Commerce City that thought they were consuming cocaine and they were consuming fentanyl and it killed them all. And that is what I think the legislature was trying to address, this idea that you think you're using heroin and there's a lot of fentanyl there, or you think you're using cocaine and there's a lot of fentanyl there, so you're not really aware knowingly is the mental state for possession of narcotics, you're not really aware that there's fentanyl in whatever illicit drug that you're doing. And I think they were trying to fix that by saying, well, I didn't know. I mean, I thought I was snorting cocaine. I thought I was shooting heroin. And I think they tried to address it. I think the way they addressed it may very well be unconstitutional, and either the Colorado Supreme Court or the U.S. Supreme Court is going to tell Colorado, you got it wrong. In that particular case, uh, who, in essence, approaches the courts to say, hey, they got it wrong? How does that happen? Well, I guarantee you the state public defender's office in Colorado will be appealing this statute Um, trying to say that the statute is unconstitutional because they have a burden now to prove something in a criminal case. And, uh, you know, obviously if that is raised, then the district attorney gets involved and the attorney general, any time there's an attack on a statute, the attorney general of the state of Colorado can come in and try to defend the statute. This is um, fascinating, troubling. Um George, there's something that uh, uh, we at CSI certainly believe in, and that's accountability. 
and they now have the, the report points towards public policy accountability and a public-facing data dashboard. Uh, they think it's going to be a powerful tool for community researchers and policymakers to combat the crime of fentanyl crisis. How do you see the dashboard working? And you just a few minutes ago made your own forecast as to what the dashboard's going to look like. So how do you see this uh, working? And and if we get information that you're suggesting, what do you hope will come of it? First, I think that this is probably an idea that should be applied across the criminal justice perspective. Uh, perspective. And in, in, in part, you know, what we've seen from the legislature going back, and both sides do this, we don't make decisions based on data. We make decisions based on anecdote and emotion. And so you see a lot of laws that get passed that are the product of a single story, sometimes a story that doesn't even happen here in Colorado. And we saw a lot of that in the debates with this fentanyl bill. Very few numbers that made a difference other than the truth that four grams of pure fentanyl will kill 2,000 people. Everything else was anecdote and emotion-driven. This would give us the opportunity to do a couple things. One is to try to get uniform information provided across 64 pretty diverse counties in the state of Colorado and to provide it in a way that is easily digestible by not just the public but by policymakers who may say, what if we did this? What impact will it have? What we don't have right now, Earl, is the way to go back in time and to compare apples from 2017 to apples from 2022. And until we put ourselves in that position, we can't really know what the impact, good or bad, is of this. The, the metrics we're using are ones it's hard to argue with, and that is the increased number of deaths, the increased number of overdoses. But if we're going to get this right, we have to have more readily available metrics, agree upon what they mean, and then move forward with good policy. Okay, so you agree with the process. I do. Uh, Mitch, your comments? I agree, too. And, Earl, I want to thank you for doing this show. And the reason I do is that the word needs to get out. And legislation aside, the word needs to get out that this is a deadly substance. And if you try it, it may kill you. And it may be in a drug that you don't think you're doing fentanyl. And we need to scare people to understand that fentanyl may be there. And unless you're testing the narcotics that you're about to use on a Friday night and you determine there's fentanyl there, I think just the sheer fact that we get the word out on how deadly this substance is and how evil drug-dealing people mix it in with other narcotics, don't do those other narcotics because it may kill you unless you know if there's fentanyl there or not. Uh, my daughter lives in New Orleans, and she enjoys Mardi Gras. She rides on the float. She does all that. And she said this year was the first time in the decade that she's been going to Mardi Gras that people were not using drugs at the level they've been using them in the past because they are so scared of this fentanyl. And they are not using what they think is cocaine. They're not using what they think is methamphetamine because they know that this deadly substance can be mixed in here. And that's why I think the Colorado legislature missed the boat completely when it comes to making this the deadly substance that it is and possessing it should be a felony. I don't think there's a better ending to this conversation than your comments and George, Mitch, I just can't thank you enough for your time and all that you've done in the studies and helping us better understand the issues and also all the work you've done in trying to work down at the legislature so they really understand the issue. Uh, you guys uh, are incredible at your professions as also as you know, public citizens. Thank you so much. Thank you, Earl. And thanks for doing this. Thank you for listening to the Common Sense Digest. For more on today's topic, as well as our research on the most pressing public policy issues facing Colorado, please visit commonsenseinstituteco.org. The preceding episode, along with all others, is available on podcatchers everywhere or on our website under the podcast tab. Our technical producer is John Ekstrom and Deft Communications. This has been a production of the Common Sense Institute.